Have you ever been desperate? Have you ever been in a situation that seems impossible to deal with? Many people in our nation right now are feeling that way. The statistics are showing us that substance abuse, because of COVID, because of the shutdown, because of uh, businesses failing, that substance abuse is on the increase, suicide rates are going up as well. Why is that? Because people have no hope. They have lost hope. And that really is what being desperate means. You're in a situation where you feel hopeless. Well, we know from the Word of God that we as believers are never to be without hope. Amen? But let me ask you to consider with me what Ephesians chapter 2 puts before us, where it says, there are people in the world, apart from Christ, who having no hope and without God in this world, having no hope without God in the world, that is a under, an understandable desperation because people are without God. But what about us who have come to know God uh, through His Son, Jesus Christ? I propose this this morning. I propose that we consider the desperation of having hope in God alone. The desperation of having hope in God alone. Um, let me explain a little bit further. In James chapter 1, verses 5 through 8, uh, the Bible says, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all men liberally without reproach, and it will be given to him. So when we face a situation that seems hopeless, what are we to do? We are to pray unto the Lord our God. But then it says, But let him ask in faith with no doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. Let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all of his ways. What does it mean to be a double-minded man or woman, a double-minded Christian? Because he's writing to believers here. It simply means that we have faith in God, but it is not a faith that is in God alone. In other words, it's double-minded faith. We trust in God, but then we doubt God. We trust in the Lord. Why do we doubt? Because we start thinking, well, it's up to us, or we, we begin to put our faith in the wrong place. So misplaced faith is a real serious problem in the Christian life. And so for us to be desperate for God simply means this. It is the belief that only God can save us. It is the belief that whatever we are facing, God is able to meet our need, no matter what it is. And this morning, I want us to consider that having faith in God alone and being desperate for Him is the call of God upon our lives at this time. Let me give you an example of how this has happened in Lynch, Kentucky. We had the privilege uh, a Saturday week ago to hear Lonnie Riley, who has been used of God so greatly in that community. That's his hometown, actually. He returned there because God called he and his wife to return to this small community. At one time, there were 10,000 people or more. It was a thriving community. U.S. Steel had built the community back in the, uh, I guess, 30s and 40s. And over the years, as things began to change, U.S. Steel eventually pulled out. And the population of Lynch, Kentucky, shrank from 10,000 to about 500. The unemployment rate in the county was at around 59%. There was no hope, there were no jobs, and there was no hope for jobs. But there were people who still lived there who decided that they were going to pray. And so they called for a special prayer meeting. And about 300 people from the tri-state area, or tri-city uh, area, came uh, in a park, and they met, and they prayed. And Lonnie was at that prayer meeting. And I asked him 
uh, when he was here recently about that prayer meeting. And this was 20-some years ago. And as he began to share that prayer meeting, he got choked up. He became very emotional. He said, I've never been in a prayer meeting like this. People were crying out to God, lying uh, prostrate on the ground. They, 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 were, they had to have an answer from God. That's desperation. When they know, they said, God, if you don't come and do something, we're going to die. We must have an answer. And God did answer. He came and he showed up and he began to move and work in very real and tangible ways. As a matter of fact, things began to happen over these last 20 years that could be called nothing less than a spiritual and economic revival. And this move of God was clearly marked as his activity. And that is what we want to talk with you about this morning, this idea of being desperate for God. Turn with me to 2 Chronicles this morning, chapter 20. 2 Chronicles, chapter 20. And I want to share with you uh, the story of King Jehoshaphat and a desperate situation that he faced and how he prayed and the people prayed and how God answered their prayer of desperation. 2 Chronicles chapter 20. And it happened after this, verse 1, that the people of Moab with the people of Ammon and others with them besides the Ammonites came to battle against Jehoshaphat, who was the king of Judah. Then some came and told Jehoshaphat, saying, A great multitude is coming against you from beyond the sea, from Syria. And they are in Hazazon Tamar, which is in Gedi. Notice verse 3. And Jehoshaphat feared and set himself to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. So Judah gathered together to ask help from the Lord. And from all the cities of Judah, they came to seek the Lord. Get the picture. I mean, they're coming from everywhere. They realize that they're outnumbered. Three nations of armies have come together to fight against them. And they know they're outnumbered. And they know that, humanly speaking, they're in serious trouble. And they desperately needed the Lord. Verse 12. He prayed and said, O oh, our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power against this great multitude that is coming against us, nor do we know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. That was a prayer of desperation. We have no power against this multitude. We don't even know what to do. So our eyes are fixed on you, Lord. Let me propose to you this morning that we as Christians should always be desperate for God. It should be a continual attitude of faith, not just when we face possible disaster. We should always be completely desperately in need of our God. For you see, we're all in constant spiritual danger. The Bible says that our enemy roams about seeking whom he may devour. He wants to destroy you and your family. He wants to destroy your marriage. He wants to destroy your children. He hates us all, and we are in constant spiritual danger. Therefore, we should always be desperate for God's help and protection. The truth is, we are completely helpless without Jesus Christ. We are completely helpless without Jesus Christ. Without Christ, we can do nothing. John 15 and verse 5, Jesus teaching about him being the vine and we the branches. He said, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. And I wonder, do we really believe that? How many of us really believe that without Jesus, we can do nothing? Do we not say, oh, well, there's a lot we can do without Jesus, but nothing of eternal value, nothing that can be done to fulfill the will of God, we cannot do it apart from Jesus Christ. But with Christ, we can do all things. Paul said in Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. 
In other words, when we are with Christ and we are dependent upon Him, we gain the right perspective on every situation we face. Whatever you're facing right now, whatever we are facing as a nation right now, we gain His perspective when we call upon Him in desperation. Notice also, not only are we uh, uh, understanding that without Christ we can do nothing, without Christ we have nothing. 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 7, Paul told the Corinthians, What do you have that you didn't receive? Would you answer that question? What do you have that you didn't receive from God? He goes on to say, And if you did receive it, why do you boast as though you did not? In other words, without Christ, we have nothing. As a matter of fact, we must consider the fact that everything that we have has come from God as a wonderful gift. But with Christ, we have everything. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? That's Romans chapter 8 and verse 32. Without Christ, we have nothing, but with him, we have everything. Come on, folks. We have everything. Everything. The Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3 that His divine power has given us, listen to this, everything we need for a godly life. In Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3, we read, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. So, without Christ, we have nothing, but with Christ, we have everything that we need. Without Christ, we have no life, actually. Jesus said, I have come that they may have life, and that they may have it more abundantly. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man can come to the Father except it be by me. And Paul said in Colossians 3 and verse 4, your life is is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with Him in glory. Isn't that a wonderful thought? And so, we have no life apart from Jesus Christ. And Paul, in preaching uh, to those who were uh, not aware of, of the true God yet, said in Acts 17, verse 28, for in Him, that is in God, in Christ, we live and move and have our being. And consider this. In Colossians chapter 1, in verse 16, we read, For by Him, that is Jesus Christ, all things were created, that are in heaven, that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through Him and for Him. Jesus created everything, and He is before all things. And listen to this. And in Him, all things consist or hold together. Do you know what that means? That means that if Jesus Christ were to ever take His hand off of the planet we live on, it would cease to exist. Do you think we're dependent on Jesus? Do you think there's anything that we can do or, or, or have apart from Him? No. Therefore, I submit that we are indeed in a situation where we are always in need, desperately in need of God in our lives. The old hymn says it this way, I need Thee every hour, most gracious Lord. No tender voice like Thine can peace afford. I need Thee, oh, I need Thee. Every hour I need Thee. Oh, bless me now, my Savior, I come to thee. And they've taken that song and modernized it a little bit. And maybe you've heard it on Christian radio. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense, my righteousness. Oh, God, how I need you. And that should be our attitude all the time, how much we need the Lord. Is it not easy for us to slip into thinking that, well, yeah, I need the Lord, but I'll be okay. or and, and all of a sudden, we're not really crying out to Him or depending on Him, and we slip into a self-dependent mode. Is that easy to do? So God must then do something 
to help us realize how much we need Him. I think that's what's going on right now in our country. God is allowing many things to happen that are very difficult. And I believe that God, more than anything else, is reminding the church, reminding us all, just how much we need Him and how dependent we must be upon Him. Consider our desperate situation in America. No matter what happens a week from Tuesday in the election, there's going to be a lot of people who are angry with the results. There is a threat of civil war that will leave us very vulnerable to outside threats. Our enemies would not, uh, like nothing better than for internal turmoil to get so bad and we become so sidetracked by that that they would take advantage of our vulnerability. Consider with me also the threat of lawlessness in our nation, leaving us vulnerable to inside threats as well. And consider most of all the threat of spiritual deception that leaves our nation vulnerable to spiritual threats. Without a doubt, the very, uh, the very reality of, of remaining a free nation is at stake right now in our nation. We're at a precipice where we could go one way or the other. And so this desperate situation, these desperate times, calls for desperate prayers to our God. So let's go back to Second Chronicles 20 again, and let us notice the story. And I trust you'll be encouraged, edified, and blessed by the Word of God. First of all, I want you to notice as we examine the prayer of Jehoshaphat, the king, he called them all to come. He said, let's fast, let's pray, come. And all the people from all the cities throughout Judah, they came to pray. Imagine that. It was a desperate prayer, first of all, to an all-powerful God, an all-powerful God. Notice in verse 5, Then Jehoshaphat stood in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem, in the house of the Lord before the new court, and said, O Lord God of our fathers, listen to this, Are you not God in heaven? And do you not rule over all the kingdoms of the nations? And in your hand is there not power and might, so that no one is able to withstand you? When the king prayed, he began his prayer, this desperate prayer, and he knew that he was praying to an all-powerful God. Has that God changed at all in our day? Not at all. He is still Almighty God, and nothing is too hard for him. Notice it was also a desperate prayer to a covenant-keeping God. Verse 7, Are you not our God? So first of he says, you're the powerful God of creation, and your power and might, no one can stand before it. And by the way, you are our God. Isn't that wonderful? Oh, folks, isn't it wonderful today to know that he's our God? He's our Father, and he is with us. And he says, are you not our God, who drove out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel, and gave it to descendants of Abraham, your friend forever? And they dwell in it, and have built you a sanctuary in it for your name, saying... If disaster comes upon us, sword, judgment, pestilence, or famine, we will stand before this temple and in your presence, for your name is in this temple, and cry out to you in our affliction, and you will hear and save. Do we have a covenant-keeping God? How did God make a covenant with us? It was through the blood of Jesus Christ. Listen, the how much does he love us? What, what depth of promise has he made to us? It is a promise made in the shed blood of his son upon Calvary's cross. We serve and we pray to a covenant-keeping God. Thirdly, notice it was a desperate prayer to a threat-removing God. Verse 10, And now, here are the people of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, whom you would not let Israel invade when they came out of the land of Egypt, but they turned from them and did not destroy them. And just a side point, these are descendants of Esau, and God made a promise to Esau and his descendants, and uh, so he didn't ask Israel or allow them to go in. Just a side point. So 
King Jehoshaphat said, that's what you told us, but notice then what he said. <laughs> so here they are, <laughs> rewarding us by coming to throw us out of your possession, which you have given to us to inherit. Oh, our God, will you not judge them? And here again is his desperate prayer to this God who can change anything, for we have no power against this great multitude that is coming against us, nor do we know what to do, but our eyes are up on you. What a simple but powerful prayer that the king prayed before the nation. Whatever you're facing today, whatever you're going through, God can handle it. Our God can handle it if we will let him, if you will let him. Like Jehoshaphat, you may feel powerless against the thing which you are facing, your situation. Maybe you don't know what to do. Maybe you have no clue about how this is all going to work out. Therefore, we should do as Jehoshaphat and fix our eyes on God, on the Lord. He will see you through. And he will see us as a nation through as well if we call upon his name. In Isaiah 43 and verse 2, the Bible promises this. God says, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. And when you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, nor shall the flame scorch you. Now, we would rather, this scripture says, uh, when you uh, are able to walk around the water or, or when you're able to go over the river or when you're able to not have to go through the fire. But what does the Bible say? God says, as you go through these things, he never promised us that it would be easy. He says, as you go through what you're going through, I will be with you. Did he not say, I will never leave you and I will never forsake you? And he will keep that promise. Well, I want you to notice how God responded to Jehoshaphat's prayer. They received a word from God. Verse 14. Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benaiah, the son of Jeel, the son of Mataniah, a Levite of the sons of Asaph, in the midst of the assembly. And he said, Listen, all you of Judah and you inhabitants of Jerusalem, and you, King Jehoshaphat, thus says the Lord to you, Do not be afraid nor dismayed because of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Amen? When we face, as a nation, as a family, as a church, as individuals, when we face things that we cannot fix, things that are so much greater than we can handle, we desperately need a word from God. I've often prayed at this time, all of this year, Lord, what are your intentions for America? Is it not true, my brothers and sisters, we deserve God's judgment. We deserve his judgment. We cannot in any way stand before a holy God any other way than saying we deserve your judgment. Because of the many atrocious and wicked things that are happening in our nation. And yet we cry out for his mercy, do we not? But we need to know, we, we need a word from God. And, and, and here's what I've done. I've, I've stepped back and I've looked at the fact about the prayer movement that has been going on in our nation for some time and around the world. It is really an amazing thing. And how we prayed and how God has intervened and really gave us a, pre, a reprieve, I believe, in 2016. And he's done all this for us. And now all of a sudden this has happened and come upon us. And uh, I... I, I, I I want to know, and, and it just seems to me, and many people agree with this sense that God, as we cry out to Him, He's hearing us, and He's going to do something. God, well, we know that He's going to do something because He's God. He can't do anything. God is not up in heaven saying, well, I really don't care. He cares about everything. He is with us. So we need a word from God. What was the word from the Lord to uh, Judah the king and the people. 
Don't be afraid. I know you're outnumbered. This great multitude has come against you, but I've got this. The battle is mine. I'll take care of it. Amen? That's greatly encouraging, is it not? It reminds me of young David who said to the Philistine giant, nobody else would go out, they were all trembling and afraid, and he looked around and said, why doesn't go, somebody go fight this big giant guy? God is fully able, and they said, get out of here, you little brat. But God had a plan for a little brat, David, didn't he? And so David said this, you come to me with a sword, with a spear, and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defiled, defied. This day, the Lord will deliver you into my hand. I will strike you and take your head from you. Whoa. And this day, I will give the carcasses of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Then all the assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with sword and spear. For the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. Isn't that encouraging? Little David, he knew God would take care of things, and God did just that. Returning to the text, verse 16. Tomorrow, here's what God told them to do. Go down against them. They will surely come up by the ascents of Ziz, and you shall find them at the end of the brook before the wilderness of Jeruel. You will not need to fight in this battle. Now, this was not always the case. Sometimes God said, you're going to have to go. You're going to have to fight. You're going to have to take your armor and your, your sword, and you're going to have to engage the enemy. But this time, here's what he said. You're not going to have to even fight in this battle. Position yourselves. Isn't that interesting? Take your right place. There's a lot right there, my brothers and sisters. Take your right place. Take your position of faith. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord who is with you. O Judah and Jerusalem, do not fear or be dismayed. Tomorrow go out and fight against them. The Lord is with you. Now, the interesting thing about the, what comes next is that the king and the people responded to the word from God with great faith. Notice verse 18. And Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground, and all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem bowed before the Lord, worshiping the Lord. They worshiped the Lord. Have they won the victory yet? Well, no, not technically, but God says it's yours, but they haven't even engaged the battle yet. They haven't gone out, and yet they're, what are they doing? They're worshiping God. Let's keep reading. Then the Levites of the children of the Kohathites and of the children of the uh, of the uh, Korahites stood up to praise the Lord God of Israel with voices loud and high. <laughs> oh, I hope you come in here, sing loud, sing high. You say, I can't sing. We don't care. God doesn't care. Just lift up your voices to God and be joyful. Amen. That's what they did. You know what they were doing? They were celebrating the victory before the victory had come. Ah, oh, there's a lot right there. They were celebrating the victory before the victory had even come. Why, how could they do that? Because God told them, I'm going to take care of this. I've got this. And so they began to worship God. They began to praise the Lord. Verse 20. So they rose early in the morning and went out into the wilderness of uh, Tekoa. And as they went out, Jehoshaphat, stood and said, so here they are, the armies are coming out, and he's there leading them, and he says, Hear me, O Judah, and you inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, and you shall be established. Believe his prophets, and you shall prosper. That's Second Chronicles 2020. Do you remember in January of this year, as we began to think about all the good things that God was going to do, I had a series of messages ready for, to preach to you through Matthew, and we started that. But this was one of our verses that we alluded to, that if we will believe the Lord, we talked about having a 2020 vision and focus. Remember that? 
And we, and I shared this verse with you as an example of having a 2020 vision. Let me read it again. Believe in the Lord your God, and you shall be established. Believe his prophets, and you shall prosper. And then look what happened this year. Oh, God, God probably just didn't hear our prayers, and he's forgotten about us. No, no. This is his plan. I told you this earlier this year, that the way that people have been praying here, locally, regionally, statewide, nationwide, well, all, listen, all that has happened this year is an answer to prayer. It is. Now, isn't it interesting that as we started out with Second Chronicles 2020 in this year of vision, and God is going to do great things, here we are nearing the end of the year, and God has brought, back, brought us back to this verse again. And I hope this will encourage you to realize God hasn't missed anything. Listen, He's still sitting on the throne. He still knows what He's doing. And to think that His hands are tied and He, he got caught off guard, oh, come on, folks. That's not the God we know and love. And so, believe in the Lord your God. You shall be established. Believe His prophets and you shall prosper. And when he had consulted with the people, he appointed those who should sing to the Lord and who should praise the beauty of holiness as they went out before the army. And they were saying, Praise the Lord, for his mercy endures forever, except they were singing it. How's this for a battle plan? All right, army, get ready. Who's going to take the lead? Who's going to go first? The people with the spear, the shields, who... It's going to be the Levites. They're going to be leading us in praise and worship. Come on, folks. It's amazing. This is a battle plan. Yes, go out and just praise God. Just lead us out. You're going to lead the way. The armies will follow your lead. And then God demonstrated his power. Verse 22. Now, when they began to sing and praise... The Lord set ambushes against the people of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir. He set ambushes against them. Now, you know what the word ambush means, right? You're going along, and all of a sudden, your enemy just ambushes you. you go, Ooh, and overtakes you and catches you by surprise. And, you're... and The Bible says that God set ambushes against the enemies of Israel who had come against Judah, and they... And they, the enemies, were defeated. How did that happen? What does it mean? Let's keep reading. For the people of Ammon and Moab stood up against the inhabitants of Mount Seir, those are Edomites, Esau's descendants, to utterly kill and destroy them. And when they had made an end of the inhabitants of Seir, they helped to destroy one another. Whoop-de-doo, what in the world is going on? So God, I say, how'd he do it? I don't know. All I know is, by the way, here's a great prayer to pray. Learn to pray. And pray it in the Spirit. Pray it in the name of Jesus and believe God. Lord, bring confusion to the enemy's camp. That's a great little prayer. Bring confusion to the enemy's camp and all the evil that he's trying to do. And so that's exactly what God did. And the victory was won. Israel didn't even know this yet. They, they're not out there yet. But this is what God was doing. Isn't this amazing how God, look, God's at work all around us. We may not see the results yet. Our God is at work, you see. And, and uh, so he did this. They basically destroyed themselves. Notice what happened next. Verse 24, so when Judah came to a place overlooking the wilderness, now get the picture here, they haven't seen anything yet, so they're coming up to a mountaintop or a hilltop or whatever where they can see the enemy, and they get to the top, and here's what they see. Watch this. Uh, so when they came to that place, they looked toward the multitude, and there were their dead bodies fallen on the earth, and no one had escaped. They're all dead. Come on, that's... That's pretty impressive, isn't it? Who did that? Did the army do that? God did that. Listen, God did this without an army at all. Why did he tell them to go out there? Well, he just did. 
He wanted them to see the hand of God. And so he said, go out, take your position, be faithful, go out. But I'm going to take care of this. You know they had to look around and say, wow, this is really something. Look at that, they're all dead. <laughs> the battle really was the Lord's the whole time. Praise be to his name. Notice that the king and the people celebrate the, the blessings of the victory. Verse 25. When Jehoshaphat and his people came to take away their spoil, they found among them an abundance of valuables on the dead bodies and precious jewelry, which they stripped off for themselves. More than they could carry away, it took them three days to gather the spoil because there was so much. Wow. The spoils of victory. Um, spiritually speaking, and even in a practical sense, this is the God we serve. When he brings a victory to us, there are blessings, okay? The spoils of victory, there are blessings that God brings to us because we've trusted in him. Now, I realize that the jewelry and all these mentioning here are talking about money, and you know God sometimes can a transfer of wealth can occur where the kingdom of God comes into money. Listen to this. At times when the whole world doesn't know how they're going to make it, and all of a sudden the church is doing great. I mean, that can happen. Come on, our God can do these things, you see. So why do we worry? Come on, folks, why do we worry? There is no worry. There's nothing to worry about. And notice they return with joy and rejoicing. Verse 26. And on the fourth day, took them three days to get all the spoil. And on the fourth day, they assembled in the valley of Barakah, for there they blessed the Lord. Therefore, the name of that place was called the valley of Barakah until this day. You know what that word means? It means the valley of blessing. The valley of blessing. Then they returned every man of Judah and Jerusalem with Jehoshaphat in front of them to go back to Jerusalem with what? Joy, say it with me, joy, for the Lord had made them rejoice over their enemies. One way or another, come on folks, one way or another, the Lord will cause us to rejoice over our victory, over our enemies. I know what you're thinking. Our enemies are those principalities and those powers, and those demonic forces that are behind all of this, and whatever may happen a week from this Tuesday, no matter what happens, we will be able to rejoice in the Lord and the God of our salvation because he is our God. And yes, we are believing God to rescue our nation and bring our nation back to himself as well. So they came to Jerusalem with stringed instruments and harps and trumpets to the house of the Lord. There's one last thing that I think is so awesome in this story, and it's found in verse 29. Listen carefully. And the fear of God was on all the kingdoms of those countries when they heard that the Lord had fought against the enemies of Israel. Word got out. You know what the word was? Look what the Lord, all capitals, look what Jehovah, look what Yahweh did for Israel. And you know what it caused in them? It caused them to deeply respect Yahweh. To fear him. Then the realm of Jehoshaphat was quiet, for his God gave him rest all around. Where did the rest come from? Because, listen to this, they prayed, they fasted, they prayed, they cried out to God. God heard their desperate prayers. He came and wrought a great victory for them in such a way that everybody around them, there was no doubt about it, that God had done this. And as a result of that, they left Israel alone. And the Bible says that there was quiet, at least for a time, because of what God had done. You see, my brothers and sisters, when God does what only God can do, he gets the glory. And people see God, not just people. Yes, he uses us, he works through us, but are you with me? Don't we want to see God do what only God can do? And does he not bring us to a desperate place so it'll have to be God 
because there's no other way that it could ever be met. And you see, that's, that's why desperation is needed. Not desperation that says, we have no hope. No, a desperation that says, oh God, you are our only hope. And I believe that that posture of faith will please the Lord. And I believe that he will answer in his own way. What was their desperate prayer again? Oh, our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power. Say that with me. We have no power. We have no power. Do you mean it? Without him, do we, we have no power against the great multitude that is coming against us, they prayed. We do not know what to do. Would you say that with me? We don't know what to do. So our eyes are fixed on you. God and God alone is our hope. And all the things that are happening around us are for this purpose, that we as his people will get desperate for him. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you this morning that you are a God who can do the impossible, and therefore you allow us to come into situations where we can't fix it. It's beyond our ability. Uh, the problem is such uh, of a nature that we, we don't have a way out, except it be for you. Lord, we cry out to you today for our nation. We cry out to you to do what only you can do, and do it in such a way that all will know that it's you. Father, we know not what to do. We have no power against all of the evil that is pressing upon us on our own. Therefore, our eyes are fixed on you. Come and help us, Lord. We need you, Lord. We need you. Oh, every hour, every moment, we need you. Create in our hearts that sense of single-minded faith that is not divided between God and our money or God and our government or God and anything else, but only in the Lord. Only you, God. We can't snap our finger and this sense of desperation for you will occur. It must rise up from our hearts and in our souls that you are our only hope. And as we cry out to you in this manner, we leave the results to you. But by faith we declare our God is able. We look to you, Father, and we wait to see what you're going to do. And we are excited about the results. We are ready to give you praise even before the victory comes. Help us to celebrate the victory that is already ours, that has already been won by Jesus Christ, our risen Lord, and by the God of of our fathers, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ. You, God, this is our hope and our prayer. And we offer our thanks for this, that we would take our positions, that we would be where we need to be, doing what we need to be doing by trusting in the power of your Holy Spirit. And as we are being faithful and we're praying and we are dependent upon you, we believe that we will see your mighty hand at work. We offer up our thanks even now for it, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen.